Welcome back to Live with the Mod, the Poet, powered by Revolution of One, where we have the greatest guest and most powerful conversations, and today is no different. Today, we got a special guest on the program with us today, legendary journalist, author, executive producer, trailblazer, the good brother, Toure. How you doing today, King? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Such a nice introduction. Appreciate that. No, it's an honor and, and, and it's a blessing to have you on the show for a few moments. And um, I really appreciate this. Um, I'm humbled extremely to have you on. And I, I just want to uh, just say that. Just I appreciate your time. I appreciate uh, I mean, I'm happy to do it. Absolutely. I wanted to uh, start off because um, I, I see that. I mean, I follow you on Twitter and I see that you're really active on Twitter and um, you you interact with um, a lot of the followers on Twitter and just a lot of the people um, who are just speaking on different social commentary. I wanted to ask you, do you think that is um, a mature? Do you think social media is a mature enough space for um, actual serious commentary? That's a great question. For the most part, no. Uh, mm-hmm. For the most part, um, I mean, because it's so short, because you're interacting with so many people at the same time. um, Mm. No, quite often you're not having a mature conversation or certainly not of the intellectual level. If you were chopping up an idea with, you know, three, four people who you respect, who, Mm. you know, certain level, you know, I find quite often I am doing things at basically like a remedial level. Um, Mm. Just as one example, we were talking about uh, the gun conversation, gun safety conversation yesterday. And of course, you know, somebody on the right says, you know, well, the Democrats had the White House, the Senate and Congress for two years and you didn't do anything. So, Mm. you know, and it's like, well, you know, so now I'm in like remedial 101 politics of like, well, the Democrats in this time you're talking about never had a filibuster proof majority in the Senate. So even though they had the majority, that doesn't really mean you can mean you can do anything that you want in the Senate. Mm-hmm. You have to have a filibuster proof majority, which I mean, at this stage in history, it appears um, that it would be impossible for uh, the, the Democrats to ever achieve that. Um, but like, instead of having a real conversation about guns, it's, you know, we're going back to like 101, you know, Mm -hmm. but I mean, you know, there's a, there's a certain fun in some of that Twitter conversation, um, you know, but, uh, yeah, so quite often you're like, oh my God, I'm rolling my eyes at like how, you know, I mean, like if somebody could make an argument that the left could do more to work towards gun control, Mm. but like the notion that like, well, you had all three branches and why didn't you do anything? Well, like that, you know, know, we also had somebody saying, well, Sandy Hook happened during Obama. um, So his gun policies didn't work. Ergo, the left, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, guys, you know, we don't like radically change gun policy, like, you know, for every president. So like that Sandy Hook happened while Obama was president doesn't prove anything. But then even you get into like deeper things, like a lot of the people on the right are dealing with um, ideas that were sort of given to them and they don't really fully understand the lies that they're repeating. And you get people who are like, well, there are shootings in Democrat run cities, ergo, your approach to gun control doesn't work. And it's like, well, you know, I mean, these, these, that, that just doesn't really make a lot of sense as an argument. So do you feel like the most effective way to convey your message is to like stump your, like to, uh, cause your opponent to stumble? Because I mean, some of the most effective tweets I see is just people like with witty replies or just giving you a reply that's just like, you can't come back from, you can't, it's just like touche. It's like I that. Mean, yeah, I mean, a lot of times you're talking to, you're a lot of times I'm talking to somebody who mm-hmm. their, uh, their education, and by that I, mean, I don't just mean like high school and college, but like what news 
media do they consume? What books do they read? What mm-hmm. other people are they talking to about politics? All of that that forms their intellect. Um, you know, they're dealing with a complete misunderstanding of what America actually is and what the American political system actually is. So I'm kind of talking to you, but I'm really talking to other people because I don't really operate on some belief that I can change your mind. I might Mm. be able to, more likely I can give you, who agrees with me but doesn't necessarily fully know why, a further explanation of why you should agree with me, right? Because you already were like, I think he's right, but I don't know why such and such. Like, well, this is why that. So I'm, I'm, I, it appears like I'm talking to, you know, MAGA dude, but I'm, I'm actually talking to somebody else. But yeah, I mean, a lot of those conversations are meant to be fun rather than, actually educational and it comes to all different sides i just did an article Mm. about how drake is not top 10 all time he's not top 20 all time i see people out here talking about he's number one or number two all time i'm like that's insanity (laughs) that's in fucking sanity and you know you get people like shooting back at you like how could you say that and, 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 you know, the number one argument for the Drake supporter is sales, right? Streaming sales. He is a gigantic figure in far, as far as modern numbers, right? Mm. No doubt. But in the article that I posted, part, the, the problem with basing your argument for a rapper on sales is that there's really a, only so many devoted hip hop fans who are going to go out and buy a record that might be, let's say 2 million people. That might be two and a half million people. So, you know, we could look and see like, here's somebody who's not crossing over who can go double platinum. Right. And, and, and I'm, I can't name them off my head, but like you and I can look at some, you know, like, you know, DJ quick or whatever, he's not crossing over and he can get one, 2 million, whatever. So there's like one to 2 million serious hip hop fans, something like that. Drake is consistently getting around 6 million. That's great. But that means that he has brought in several million pop fans. So there's probably 3 million people in America who have Drake, you know, I was going to say a Drake CD or a Drake download. But then the rest of their stuff is like, you know, Taylor Swift, you know, Foo Fighters, like, you know, Arcade, like whatever. Like they're not hip hop fans. Is so if you include sales to prop up Drake as the one or two greatest artists, then that means that white people who don't care about hip hop are having a deciding vote in our conversation about who's the greatest rapper. Now, people who really understand hip hop understand all of that. I don't have to explain any of that, but people who are at a different level of, of education, to go back to that word, they don't understand that. And they're just like, Drake sold 6 million. That makes him better than Jay-Z, because Jay-Z went 2 million. That makes him better than Nas, because Nas mm-hmm. went 2 million. That's fucking ridiculous. Um, the main point I, I, I argue in that piece about Drake, which is on the Grio, um, is that... And you could, I could write, you know, like a book about identifying MCs. So I had to like narrow this down really well. But to me, the core thing that an MC does is flow, right? That is the first thing that I'm listening to when I get a new song. The first couple listens, I don't know about you, I have no idea what half of the words are, right? Like we catch half of them, but you know, you might catch a nice punchline, but like, I'm not catching every word, the first, second, third listen, but I'm catching that flow and I'm catching how you're moving through the beat and how you're changing the flow, how you're relating to the beat. And if that flow is dope, then I want to keep listening to the record and understand all the words that you're saying and what you use to build that flow. If the flow ain't shit, then I'm not really that interested in the song mm-hmm. and like digging into like what you're actually saying. And that is the thing to me that is really dope and special about hip hop, the way the MC chooses to flow through the track. Mm. Now, and that, and that's where you really get to a 
musical level of interaction with the music, right? The writing is important, and that's one thing, but how do you relate to the beat, the flow? I'm talking about Jay-Z, Nas, Black Thought, uh, mm. Big, um, Andre 3000, you know, real flow. If Drake walks in the room, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> you, he flows like a slam poet. He flows like the singer in the talk part of the song. I that, like Drake. I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm I, I, I like Drake. Drake. I love Drake. If I like a lot of Drake records, right? So I'm not saying I disagree with you. I like him. And when we say, he, we, you know, if you say he's your favorite, that's you personally. That's fine. No, you're not my favorite. But, but if you say he's the greatest, now you're making a judgment comparison versus other MCs. Mm -hmm. That's where I start to get basically triggered because I'm like, there is a set of aesthetic standards that partly includes flow that we've been rocking with and refining for decades. Mm -hmm. And the notion that Drake would come in barely able to flow and people would be like, yo, but Drake, I'm like, no, money. And, you know, I didn't say this in the article, but Drake is like Tyler Perry in this specific way. Mm -hmm. It's only the sales that enter them into a serious critical conversation. Right. Mm -hmm. If if Tyler Perry and Drake did not sell tons of records or tons of movie tickets, serious film people or serious hip hop people would not microscope the work because it doesn't it doesn't merit that. It's not that good, but it's super popular. So then we have to grapple with well, what is it and why is it hitting so many people in in, in the right spots? You know what I mean? So you know if if you just did like a blind taste test sort of thing and we don't know who sold what he he, he he if you can't think of 20 mcs who are better than him then you have not listened to enough hip-hop mm -hmm. well can i ask you this so when we talk about tyler perry do you feel like representation plays a big part like representation in the art plays a big part of like how people view him. I mean, cause I get what you're saying. I mean, it's a lot of classic films and, 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 and different things that if you compare maybe to, to some, it might, I mean, well, I don't want to, I, I don't want to play semantics. It might, it doesn't compare up. It's just, it it. I, I, I see, cause I'm, I'm trying to play, po I'm trying to play politics. Let me not it's do that. It's not what Spike Lee is doing. And Spike yeah. Lee is quite often uh, a flawed filmmaker. Whether or not you like, Jordan Peele's work, you gotta, you you can't tell me that they're all all these three filmmakers are on the same level. But Jordan but Peele to, is like far more sophisticated than yeah. Spike and Tyler. And but to play go ahead. to play God's advocate, maybe some people are just appealing to that art form. I mean, maybe there's a subgenre or a subsection of the culture that prefers that type of you know, movie or type of the, the type that gold who went to his um his plays and stuff like the old six year old lady because he said that the the um the black women like they showed out for him in droves like and they do to this day like yo we know that that he Tyler owns a demographic right mm, the, he does, yeah. the aunties right the mm -hmm. excuse me the boomer and now some part Xer older fifty plus Christian loving yes. woman on lock. And that's Absolutely. cool. That's fine. Part of why he has that group on lock is because they have been ignored and nobody mm. else is serving them. Right. So they, you know, but I mean, like, you know, I think about my mom, you know, she would definitely rather watch a Tyler Perry movie than a Spike Lee movie. First of mm. all, she say, there's cursing in the Spike Lee movie. She don't go to church. Mm. But like she, uh, there's cursing in the Spike Lee movie. That that's a no for me. Like, mm. I'm like wow, you know, uh, you know, and and then you know, she, maybe she would say that she finds the Tyler story just goes down more easily, right? Because Spike mm. and Jordan want to get in your face, yes. 
want to yeah. challenge you, want to give you beautiful visuals and complex stories. And, you know, some people don't want that. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. But don't tell me this is as good as that because there is a clear aesthetic difference. And, and you know, it pains me to act like, you know, there's not. Hmm. I definitely, I definitely see the see the argument, and um, I would just say maybe good is maybe a different word than good could be used. I don't know, if good. What do you mean? Because uh, I mean, good is relative. Like you know, like you said, your mom might think that Tyler Perry's is is, is better than Spike Lee's, but uh, maybe it's just I don't know. It's executed sharply, more sharply. Like you know, some of these you know, Inception and, and different movies, like, you know, big classic films that are just executed very sharply. I don't know. I don't know if one is better than the other. Me personally, I would say that one is better than the other, but I don't know. Good is kind of relative. Uh, I mean, I mean you see, because I, I could tell you, you don't like, you don't like teeter on the fence. So I can respect where you're coming from. You know me, I'm trying to play neutral and stuff, but. I'll say one thing is that I figured out fairly early in, in media Mm. that the just even the comment on television on twitter whatever that that straddles the fence that seeks to not offend anyone doesn't get any attention it doesn't really make a point it doesn't get any attention mm. you know if you if you get strongly behind an aggressive point mm. that people will notice right and, you know, I strive to be authentic and honest to what I believe, but I'm not going to sugarcoat what I believe to make you, you know, it's not polite conversation. That's not what it's meant to be. You know, um, if I say, you know, it, you know, if, if I, if I milk, uh, milk down my critique of Drake, so that I don't offend the Drake fan, then I'm really not saying anything. Yeah, you know, I, I, um, you know, it just I I think it's value. And and I read a study or there was this older essay that was like, you know, it, it, the audience doesn't really penalize you. Like if you are consistently going against their values, like a Skip Bayless does in in sports, like a Jason. Mm -hmm does in sports um you know like these people like like their their values stand apart from mine so i mm. you know get very deep visceral negative reaction from them but you know there's other people who you know sports is is different but there's other people who like make a bold pronouncement in politics or you know or in culture and then are proved wrong and the audience doesn't generally doesn't really notice and doesn't hold it against them for, mm -hmm. for being wrong because the audience understands uh, they were they, really the point of they were like they were entertained mm -hmm. and 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 gripped by me making a big point. So do and, you feel like there's a difference between clickbait and a compelling headline, or has like clickbait always been something? Kind of that's always been a part of media. I mean, that's a, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, like clickbait to me. Because you said you could have used any other rapper than you, you, you could have used a hundred different rappers, but you used Drake. Well, no, because Drake, Drake is the one who this argument really centers around. Right. Because mm, okay. I, I don't hear anybody else. From the from this generation, the you're only right, people you're right, you're right. About that high are Drake and Kendrick. Kendrick, yeah. Right? Kendrick is as far as skills, lyrics, flows, uh, you you know, topics, you know, quality of his voice. He's one of the all time greats, you know. And I'm looking at my peers, like how many more dope, incredible albums does Kendrick have to release before we're like, okay, so Jay Nas. Like 3K, like Kendrick's on that level, right? He hasn't had as many as Jay and Nas, but like, I think it like damn near perfect for his career already. Like it's kind of insane. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, but Drake has, I mean, like I hear a lot of millennials 
kind of argue that Drake is their favorite rapper or the number one rapper, or the number two rapper. You saw Michael B. Jordan saying that shit. I swear Kevin Durant was on Knuckleheads and he said that. And I'm like, yo, y'all, like, no. Drake is uh, one of the great all-time rappers. But in, in saying something like that, that is provocative, that grabs the, 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 the audience and it grabs the conversation and it shapes the conversation. If I said, you know, Drake is not, if you just watered that sentence down, it would just have less of an effect. I mean, like, bait to me brings in a more sort of tawdry way of trying to reach the audience. Um, I, I feel like it involves sometimes lying to the audience. Yeah, uh, over dramaticism, yeah. Yeah, rather than just like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, just say some, just take a bold position that I actually believe in. I don't say things that I don't believe in, but I do look for how can I push this, this belief further? Because if I say, you know, if I take a strong position, it just creates a better conversation and a better relationship with the audience mm -hmm. than, um, than if you take a more, let's say, modulated position that is meant to offend no one. Mm. Have you ever had like a debate show or thought about doing Have that? I had a debate show? N no, I haven't. Um, 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 uh, I think that might be that, that could be something, man. Because I, I I seen you on the uh, Sway's universe, and uh, you was uh, just having a conversation. I don't think you was debating, but I could tell you were very opinionated. And in, in, um, I forgot the, the the DJ's name on the show, and I was just like, man, I would like to see him debate. You know what I'm saying? He doesn't I mean, really look. I, I could, you know, I haven't done that. I could. I mean, like, you know, part of my media culture is that is coming from MSNBC. Right. Which is we're not here to debate. I don't think that that usually gets you very far. It certainly does not inform the audience. Um, and we can build something deeper, a deeper relationship with the audience, a deeper conversation by having someone on who's intelligent, who I agree with. Mm. And we can dive deep into a subject rather than debating up mm, here mm, and it stays shallow right and you, you know like if, if if you know to let's go back to drake if i had somebody you know a, a, like a serious hip-hop fan not saying you're not but um like just as a hypothetical person we could have we could go deep into the conversation about why it's problematic for so many millennials to be thinking that Drake is the number one or two or three best rapper of all time. That's insane. Mm -hmm. Right. And we could plumb into the flow and other things. Right. Versus I'm saying, you know, he's not top 20. He's not top 50 and somebody else go. Yeah, but the sales. And then where do we go from that? Now I have to explain to you why that's not a relevant vector. And then, mm. but you're going to explain why it is. Well, where are we going now? Who's learning anything from this conversation? Mm. We, I know people who like to argue and are good at it. Panama Jackson is good at it. You know, you can have like an argument, but um, for the most part, a lot of these arguments don't really get us anywhere. Mm. The televised arguments. Mm. That's a powerful statement. I didn't think about it like that. I'm like, you, you're actually right. You know, when you have kind of a similar belief, you can kind of dive deep into those deeper layers. I had an aha moment. I was just thinking, I was like, you was on BET with uh, um, Harry yeah. Belafonte, I believe. Um, that, and, wasn't, uh, that, wasn't on, that wasn't on BET, but yeah, I did a thing a long time ago with Paul Mooney. Yeah, Paul Mooney, yeah. Diane Belafonte. And Harry Belafonte. And uh, Spike's and Wayne Brady was the moderator and Spike Lee's wife, who's been a friend of mine for a long time, um, was producing that. Tanya Lewis Lee mm -hmm. was producing that. And, you know, she was like, I want somebody from the younger generation so that it's a multi-generational conversation. 
And um, it was such an incredible um, honor to talk to these people and to be in this conversation um, with them. And I tell you also, I just, I just happened to watch, rewatch part of it the other day. Mm-hmm. And I remember, um, Wayne Brady was doing like a top 10 list of black TV shows. And I believe what it was that he had the Richard Pryor show number 10. Mm-hmm. And as soon as he said that, like, oh, your list is fucked up. Like, there's there's no fucking way there's nine shows ahead of fucking the Richard Pryor mm-hmm. show. Like, you you fucked up. You already fucked up. And, he, and he's like, let me finish the list before you take it. Like, but you already fucked up. You start with the best. You can't, you can't get the right answer if you started with the Richard Pryor show at number 10. Mm. You know? Now, maybe if Wayne had said, well, the Richard Pryor show was only four episodes, right? Mm. And then after that, the network got scared and canceled it. Maybe, but he didn't say that. He'd say that. So anyway, yeah. So how was it meeting Paul Mooney? Paul Mooney is one of my favorites, man. Uh, Paul Mooney's the fucking shit, man. I mean, like mm. I, I spent um I spent a good little time with with Paul because I saw him on stage several times um, at like Caroline's, which is like a relatively small comedy club. Like a couple hundred people are in there, as opposed to you know when you go to an arena sort of show. Um, so like very intimate, um, like one time I went and saw him, I was dating, uh, a, a black girl who's, uh, was friends with this black guy who was dating, uh, a white girl and they saw us like right in the front. Oh yeah. It was a black guy and a white girl was right in the front for the Paul Mooney show. I was like, oh my God, he's gonna see us, he's gonna start breaking on them and la la la. Um and you know, I interviewed him for my book, um, Who's Afraid of Post Blackness? Um mm. stage in the little tiny uh prep room backstage at Caroline's, and he was just he was just dope, like that that acerbic brilliant person you get on stage that's who he was off stage it was the same it wasn't like you know there's an on stage persona it's just it was it was just the same and he talked about um his grandmother who had a special place in their community he there was some dispute over whether this had taken place in louisiana or mississippi but it was deep south And um, his grandmother had 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 some child had done something, had sassed her in some way Mm -hmm. and she had beaten the child, Mm -hmm. little white child, right? She just spanked some real white child. It was not hers. And right. And the faith you just made, I was like, (laughs) what? Like, did she get then? No, no, because she had a special role in the community. She mm. was a nanny for a lot of these kids. Yeah. And even kids who she wasn't raising, the parents were able to use her as a sort of boogeyman. Like, if you don't behave, Miss So-and-so is going to mm. spit you. Right? So they get their hands clean and she's their, you know, their, their weapon that they can threaten the kids with. Mm. So she beat somebody who she wasn't supposed to beat like they couldn't get mad at that because that's what she's known for. That's what she does. Um, so in a lot of ways, she had power in that town and self-determination from just the way she conducted herself and, and that she was willing to beat the kids, to beat these little white kids. Mm-hmm. And, and that to me was such an amazing symbol and teacher and role model and predecessor to Paul Mooney. Somebody, yeah, as this 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 black woman who's taken power in this town because she's willing and able to beat little white kids, and you know, you know that she was probably like really enjoying the shit out of that. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, Paul, Paul, Paul was the best. 
So I wanted to ask you real quick before we before we close up. Do you feel like it's 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 any spaces for us to have a deep intellectual conversation about where Black America is right now? I know um, back in the days it was uh, the state of the Black Union, and um, you had all these legends and greats getting up on the stage and just having a powerful conversation. Do you feel like there is anything like that nowadays? I hear a lot of people like reference the Revolt Summit. Not, I mean, not that I know of um, that, you know, honestly, that might exist somewhere. I I certainly haven't heard of it. I certainly haven't been invited to it. Um, I mean, you know, I wonder if that conversation is being had in, in public through the internet, through books, you know, mm-hmm. podcasts and things like that, rather than needing to pull everybody in the same physical space. Mm, okay. Dang, that's deep. I don't I didn't know. think about that. I, don't know. I didn't think about that. That's deep. That's deep. But I mean, like, you know, we are quite broad, I think, uh, 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 you know, intellectually as a, mm. as a culture, which I think is a great thing. Um, so, you know, you start to, I mean, like, you start to, like, that notion seems to almost push toward, well, who's our Black leader? Mm. And not sure that that we are a community that could have a leader because mm. now we are so complex yeah. our needs are diverse um our political desires are diverse compared you know based on you know where you live what generation you're in what generation you're in what class you're in right mm. like last in the last presidential election we saw um a lot of black millennials going for bernie sanders but mm. the black uh, boomers were going for Joe Biden, right? The Gen X was a little bit more complicated. But you saw those two groups were in complete disagreement about mm. who, you know. So you couldn't say, you know, well, black people support this person. Like, there, you know, there was a massive disagreement. And I think that's a good thing. I don't think we should just be perceived to have a singular perspective. Uh, but it's it's hard when we have a complexity of views to think about well how can we get a bunch of people in one physical space to talk about where you know because who are we not including in that physical space mm. who doesn't get to come mm. that's deep I didn't think about that you're right I mean in I hear that, you know, with voting and all type of stuff, you know, everybody, somebody's going to get excluded, especially if it's a physical space. More, it, it does make more space for everybody if it's virtual or if it's just a show. Just, but I mean, I, I feel like the desire for everybody to get their opinion in, but I don't know if it's possible for everybody to get their opinion in because, like I mean, you, said, so, you know, one thing I mean, like, you know, if we're convening black people, I mean, at one level, like for this sort of thing you're talking about at one level i'm like well i mean you know because black conservatives are black like you know should we not include them but then another level mm. like of course not of course not like mm. what are you talking about like <laughs> these people have no ideas that are valid valuable for uh the black community you know like why why would you include them like you know, and I'm not saying they're not black, but I'm saying they're part of a movement that is overtly racist and mm. general trafficking and alternate facts. I was just talking to somebody on Twitter, like you're talking about to bring it back to the beginning, who was really pushing the idea that there is evidence that January 6th was um, done by the government. Mm. What? <laughs> What? We're still talking about that after like hundreds of of right wing people have been put in prison for this. Okay. Yeah, I mean it's it's an ongoing conversation. I I see people reference it all the time, but I will say, you know, um, I feel like debating. I mean, I feel like having that opposite opinion can be good a lot. You know, I always say, you know, the truth is not scared of a lie. I mean, the 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 lie actually makes the truth seem more powerful because once the truth is presented, it's just like it it just knocks everything else out. Um, but I did want to ask you. I mean, lastly, 
um, I heard you talk on uh, Vlad TV. Um, you was talking about conversations that you like to have. And what you're interested in is people's self-talk. What is your self-talk before you have a big interview, before you, you know, um, uh, curating a conversation? What What is your self-talk to yourself to stay grounded and calm or to stay sharp? Because that's something that I need. This is a personal question for me. So I yeah. want to ask you, what, what is your self-talk? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I'm always positive with myself. Mm. I'm not negative. I don't talk down to myself. It's important that you are a great friend to yourself, Mm. right? You were hanging out with somebody who was like, yo, you ain't shit. You fucked up. Oh, my God. You would be like, yo, can you leave? Well, you know, or if you had someone who's like, you know, you, know, you can do it, you know, you, you know, you you trip, but it's cool, you know, like, you know, pick mm-hmm. it up, get it next time, you know. I, I mean, I definitely have a growth mindset in terms of I'm thinking I can always get better at anything. Um, I I if things aren't going my way in an interview, I would not beat myself up. It would not become an emotional thing. My confidence would not be rocked. It would be more like, okay, how, how can I turn this around? How can Mm -hmm. I, how can I shift this energy or this direction? How can I get more out of this person? Um, you know, it's about, you know, I I I want I want to I want to feel good about myself as I'm going through anything. So there's there's time to be reflexive or reflective, reflective, and say you know well, you know I, I could have done that better. I could have handled this better. I could have you know. And let me make sure next time I'm better prepared at this, or I'm ready if somebody does that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I never want to be like you know you know just down on myself like you didn't you like it's it's not it's not helpful you want to fill yourself with positive messages even if you're saying i need to make a change it can be addressed in a positive way Mm. rather than beating yourself up um yeah it's definitely important to speak to yourself in a positive way and to be a good a good friend to yourself, like the kind of friend you would want to have in the real world. I love that. I love that. Um, I love that. That, that definitely is, is helpful. Uh, especially for me. Um, I just noticed, um, during interviews, I have to like go into a space. I normally listen to classical music before I do interviews. And I just, I'm like, man, it's just about sharp. It's about being sharp, but also being relaxed. You know, um, I tell people all the time, um, especially coming from, uh, my city, you know, everybody done doing podcasts and I'm just like, you know, you got to be surgical with it. You got to be sharp with it. But I just wanted to hear from one of the greats, you know, how you get into that zone and how you just maintain your cool and your calm because you've interviewed the legends of the legends, you know, so. I mean, you know, one thing is, you know, I'm definitely thinking about, I'm aware of what all my questions are. Mm. I don't have to go in order. I'm listening exactly. to you. And seeing, are you leading into a question that I have that's further down the line? Mm-hmm. So you're kind of intimating, like, I'm ready to talk about this issue now. So the question I had written down as number eight becomes mm-hmm. next. Just because I'm aware of what all, you know, they're kind of, they're kind of, I'm aware of what all the issues that I want to touch on. And so you're leading me toward that. So we'll go ahead. It doesn't have to be in the order that I pre-wrote it. Like, you know, but I'm also like listening to you very carefully and trying to think about what are you saying that I need to dive deeper on? Mm-hmm. What saying that piques my natural curiosity? Sometimes, what does that mean? It's a great question. What do you mean by such and such? That's it. Doesn't have to be a long question. How did you do that? You know, just just that. Because some people will say, like, you know, and and then I achieved enlightenment. How? How'd you do that? <laughs> right now, so now they're talking about mm-hmm. something. You know, that not that they did it, but how they did it. Um, why'd you do it like that? Like short questions. 
that keep you in the moment of the story you're telling. Um, but um, I, yeah, I'm definitely listening to you. And and the fact of me listening to you very closely is important too, because when you do an interview with me, you will never feel more heard mm. all day. I am paying attention to you. I am completely focused. If you make a little joke, I'm going to catch it and laugh. Not corny, right? And laughing all up here when it was a little thing, but like I want us to feel, you know, in 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 sync. Mm. You know, you made a joke, he laughed. He asked about your life. Like he asked a deep, specific question about your life. He listened, did not interrupt, and then asked a follow-up deeper into that. Wow, like I feel really seen. And when the person is like, Do I feel really seen? They feel more comfortable to give up more. Mm. And and so I wanted to, and, and I always wanted to feel like a conversation. Yeah. I don't want to feel like, you know, so I want to ask you this question. I love it when people are like, yo, when are we starting? I'm like, yo, we started five minutes ago. I just was like mm. keeping it natural. You know, and it was not like, let me ask you a question. But I'm just like, mm. blow it in a conversation that's focused on you. Right. If we were friends, we would have an equal conversation. An interview is just going to be one directional. But I'm keeping it conversational. So, you know, and, and I'm paying attention to, you know, like, so how much time do I have left? How much time have I spent on this issue? Have we covered this issue? Is it fascinating? Is it mildly fascinating? Do I want to move on to something else? If I have this much time left and I'm running out of questions, we'll spend more time on something or I'll look for something that is completely off the menu that we can go into. Um, you know, if time is running short, then I might like jump to the next issue. So I make sure I get that in. Right. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, I'm definitely thinking about the, my relationship to the time, my relationship to how long have we scratched this issue? I remember once I interviewed Puff, Puffy, and mm -hmm. he said, he's never going to release another album, something like that. And I was like, do you, does that mean that you're never going to do any more music. And he gave me kind of a vague answer. I'm never going to release another album. It's vague. It's not as specific as it sounds. Like, does that mean you're only going to stream or you're only going to do singles or you're not doing music anymore? Like, what? Is, I, I don't understand what that means. And that's a really important thing to say, right? A really important thing to narrow down. And Puffy says, my music career is over or my album career is over, or my, my, my I'm never going to put another record in the stores, but I'm going to stream him all like, what does that mean? And later it was like a, it was like four follow-ups to nail down. Like, I don't understand what you mean. And later I went back to the office, the, 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 my manager or whatever was like, why did you spend so long in that point? I'm like, cause I didn't fucking understand what he was saying. It's an incredible important point. Mm -hmm. And Booker, I never forget, he said it was somebody who was like, you know, on the crew who was like a little bit on the lower end of the list or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, less responsibility or whatever. And and um and he had said something about to whisper something to somebody about like why doesn't he move on? Mm. And I'm like. I didn't understand. Mm. I'm the interviewer. I'm the one who did a million of these interviews for you that you liked. I didn't understand. I'm mm. sorry if the grip got it before I did, although he couldn't have because I saw more possibilities for what does that important sentence mean mm. than he did. He thought it meant one thing. I'm like, that could mean one of three things. And this is important. We got to get this nailed down because this could be newsy, whatever. So anyway, I'm just, I'm thinking about, I'm definitely thinking about how long have we spent on a given issue, but is it really important? 
you know, if you're talking about, you know, the time you almost committed suicide, I mean, like DMC from Run mm-hmm. DMC was on the show talking about the time he almost committed suicide. Mm-hmm. Best believe I'm going to spend as long as he wants to spend talking about that issue and the alcoholism and depression that led up to him wanting to commit suicide. Like, I want to go deep into that. But, you know, if, if it's not that deep of an issue, then, you know, we'll hit it. You've explained it. We'll move on. You know, just I'm just trying to gauge all these things as we're going along and make sure that it's a compelling conversation for the audience. Hmm. Uh, hold on. Um, uh, you can't hear this. Hold on one second. No, it's fine. Okay. No, but I, I really appreciate that. It's, this has been a master class in journalism. Just that those gems right there, like I, I appreciate that is invaluable to me. And I really appreciate it. I appreciate you blessing me with a few moments and just sharing some thoughts. And, and I mean, and, if you do an interview like this, like we have time to like, not like a targeted, you have five minutes. Of the, there should be at least one question that you couldn't have imagined asking before you sat down mm. that the, and you're here listening to what I'm saying and the way I'm explaining the th- like, well, wait, and I, I wouldn't have before thought to ask about this, but now that you say that it makes me think about well, what, what about this? Mm. I mean, like, like you should be paying attention well enough that new questions are coming to you as the person is talking. Mm. But, or, you know, and like, you know, 80 to 90 percent of it can be pre-written. I mean, it can, 50 percent of it could be pre-written. But like I'm saying it can't be 100 percent of it pre-written because you couldn't have no you. Nothing occurred to you while you were sitting there with the person. Mm-hmm. No, 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 no new questions jumped up in your mind. Um, so that's, you know, if you're paying close attention, then something will pop up. I love that. I love that. Absolutely. I just uh, want to be respectful of the time, but uh, no, I'm, I'm, this has been invaluable to me. Absolutely. And I appreciate you diving deep in some of these topics with me and um, just sharing a few moments with the audience, man. I, I hope you guys tune in on the next episode. This has been a powerful episode and uh, make sure y'all tune in on the next one. It's been a mod, the poet to We'll see you guys in the next one. Peace. Peace.